Let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly pray, grant us grace and endurance to run the race you have set before us. May we run to obtain your promises and so cross the finish line in that heavenly city. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If you pay any attention to our sermons here at Holy Communion, then you should know, Roger knows, you saw the word running in the collect, and you know that an allegory is not far behind. The illustration is just too strong to ignore. We are running to obtain God's promises. I want you to reflect on that during our time today. We're not sitting and waiting for God's promises to come to us. We are running to obtain them. You see, brothers and sisters, we're not mere spiritual consumers, but active participants in a race. Over the last several weeks, our time together in God's Word has largely focused on our relationship to the secular world, understanding how we are to stand out against the backdrop of the culture around us, and to speak boldly into it. But today's lessons turn the mirror away from the world and point it back at us, challenging us to strive for greater personal holiness. When we ever focus, and only ever, focus on what the world around us is doing and not pay attention so much to ourselves, we can be tricked into thinking that we are always right, that we are saved because we simply affirm the right ideas. We can easily think that because we are part of God's chosen people, then we have it all right and we don't really need to change because, after all, we're not nearly as bad as those other people particularly for those of us who have had the great blessing of walking our entire lives with the Lord, calling ourselves lifelong Christians, do we not sometimes feel as if we can be tenured into God's kingdom? As we've said many times before, God doesn't save us because of the faith of other people. We are running to obtain God's promises. And the greatest of God's promises is that he so loved us that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We, for our sin, deserve eternal damnation, but Jesus Christ bore that sin on the cross. And his righteousness is imputed to us if we only trust in him. But at that point of trusting is where we get mixed up in our understanding. So many Christians today have been or are taught to think that Christianity is a one and done religion. What I mean is that many have been told if you just say the sinner's prayer and say the right thing, perhaps trust in Jesus for only a moment, then you're set for life. It's like a get-out-of-jail-free card. You're once saved, always saved, which in this context means they say you can go ahead and just live your life however you want and don't worry about sinning all you want. You, you can look just like the rest of the world because you said a prayer and deep down inside, 
God knows your heart. God knows you're saved. What I'm speaking to is this cavalier attitude, this attitude that treats Christianity almost like a weightlifting competition. You work one time to complete this spiritual act of faith by your own strength. You lift the weight above your head, and then bang, you drop the weight, and that's it. You're done. But Christianity isn't a weight lift. Christianity isn't a club or a tenure track. The Christian life is a race. It's a marathon. And we are running to obtain God's promises. Our Christian life is a race because fighting sin is a lifelong task. And it requires us to be active. Anyone who has ever done something hard, which is all of us here, you don't need to be a running nerd like some of us in order to understand this. Anyone who has done something hard knows that you have to practice over and over and over again. You have to work day in and day out, day after day after day, in order to achieve that goal. You also have to follow the rules. If you take shortcuts, you never succeed. If you're dieting, for example, if you're sneaking snacks every single day, that's counterproductive. You're never going to lose any weight that way. Or if you're saving money for some big purpose, if you need to stick to your budget or your money will never grow. As a runner, if I want to get faster, I need to put in the work and run every single day and stick to my training plan. I need to be disciplined in my training. I don't just declare myself to be a good runner and claim all sorts of world records. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. No, I have to go out and run every day to train my body in the discipline of the sport if I wish to succeed. The point is, nobody gets what they want and nobody gets where they want by doing nothing. So why do we expect this to be the case in the Christian life? Faith is not a feeling, it's an action. Love is more than a feeling, it's an action. So then, if we trust and love the Lord Jesus, then it will obviously bear fruit in action. If we trust and love the Lord Jesus Christ, this fruit is born in a lively faith. And if we fail to exercise that faith and train ourselves in God's commands, then sin will overcome us and we will perish. Nobody becomes holy by doing nothing. Let's look at Psalm 19, which reminds us of that right relationship to God's commands. Starting in verse 9, The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. I love the way that verse 10 sounds, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. It has a real lyric element to it. And really, we should desire that discipline like sweet honey. We should desire it more than gold, which, as James will warn us, will corrode and eat away at us. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. The word used for enlightened here can also mean warned. By them is your servant warned. God's word is not just a bunch of rules to follow. They are indeed warnings 
of the evil that will befall us if we don't follow them, if we don't abide in him. Now these next verses are especially powerful. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then I shall be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. That is, keep us from sinning with unwarranted boldness. Lord, above all, keep me from sinning boldly. Such a wise thing to ask. It is one thing to spot a brother or a sister in his or her own sin, but how frightening to find yourself sinning boldly. We are more guilty of this, I think, than we would like to admit, that is, of reaching the point where our sin no longer bothers us. We get good at our sin, so good that we don't even realize it much of the time. But even in ignorance, we are still held accountable for our wrongdoings. We can't plead ignorance before the throne of God. That is why in morning prayer and throughout the year in various settings, when we confess our sins to God, we confess our sins in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We commit ourselves not only sins of commission, things that we actively do, but also sins of omission, things that we fail to do. Our sin is so pervasive that we have no option but to remain constant in prayer. And this is one reason why I so love to pray, verse 14 here, before giving a sermon. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. If we ignore God's warnings and continue to sin boldly, we will even find ourselves desiring the sin more than God's blessings. And indeed, that's what is already happening when we choose to sin. This is what the psalmist means when he speaks of sin getting dominion over us. Look at the Israelites in Numbers chapter 11. The people complain about their difficulties in the wilderness on their journey to Canaan, and they become blind to the gifts that God has given them. In fact, they also complain about Moses' leadership and God's promises. Remember, God has given them the manna in the desert because they were going to starve. They had nothing else to eat, and he makes manna fall down from heaven. And now, here they are, complaining that they have too much of it. Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this darn manna to look at. Can't stand it. God, how could you do this to us? It's almost comical how warped our perspective becomes when we're stuck in sin. Like the Israelites, our view becomes so twisted that we desire the life we had before Jesus saved us, before we were walking with God, because we want it easy. But remember, we are running a race. We are running to obtain God's promises and we aren't promised an easy journey. Few goals worth attaining are done so easily. We can see the non-Christians around us, and so many of them look like they've got it so good. They're rich, they're beautiful, they've got a great family, a big house, they've got a cool car, they're healthy, they're not in pain all the time. 
And it's hard not to think, come on, God, I want some of that. Forget all this lean junk that you've given me. I'm tired of, of looking at all of these other blessings that you've bestowed upon me. Forget that God has also already blessed us to live the most comfortable, wealthiest lives in all of human history, and that he has given us faith, hope, and love. Forget all of that, we say. I want to be like those people over there. If we don't practice personal holiness, we learn the habit of presumptuous sin. And when we practice sinning boldly, we quickly desire sin and reject the Savior. When we lack spiritual discipline, we are drawn to instant gratification because we forget how short our earthly life really is. Our reading from James chapters 4 and 5 is absolutely packed with wisdom in this regard. But one of his constant reminders in this passage is the transitory nature of life here on earth. Life on earth is temporary, and when we forget that, we no longer desire things of eternal value. We forget that everything we do and everything we have in this life is contingent upon the Lord's blessing. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. And as James points out, we boast arrogantly as if we do. We make our plans and we assume that everything is going to happen just the way we want. And then James gives us this convicting conclusion. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This is the sin of omission. And we need only to look back at the past year and a half, almost two years, to see how fast evil multiplies as a result of good men doing nothing. As the popular saying goes, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So where have the good men gone? James indicts us again later on in chapter 5. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. If we do not run to obtain the promises of God, we will slide back to the promises of the world. American cultural Christianity has most definitely normalized the prosperity and self-indulgence of the age, as with the culture at large, to the point in which most people who claim to be Christians are not even discernible from the culture at large. We have forgotten how hard it is to live a life of holiness. Rather than sober contemplation of God's judgments, we give ourselves to the addiction of constant entertainment. 21st century Christians have bought into the trivializing of daily life. To borrow from the late author Neil Postman, we are amusing ourselves to death. Like Huxley's Brave New World, we are enslaved by our addiction to easy entertainment, and we eagerly give up our Christian liberty in exchange for instant gratification. Our eyes are drawn to worthless things far more easily than they are drawn to the overwhelming beauty of the Lord. We are far more likely to look to our phones than to truth, beauty, and goodness, which are found in God's word. We must always remember that the battle 
against sin is serious. If we trivialize our daily lives with nonstop entertainment, we will never win this battle. Just as faith is an action, just as love is an action, so too is our fight for holiness active. Jesus warns us in Mark chapter 9, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, we are not called to literally dismember ourselves. Jesus is using hyperbole here, but we must not miss the point that this is the urgency we must have in running the race set before us. This is serious business. So while you may not literally cut off your hand to fight some sin, you are called, we are called, to fight tooth and nail. For those who are truly struggling, for those who are overcome with sin, when sin totally threatens to overcome us, I would borrow from Jesus' words here. For when sin threatens to overcome us, desperate times call for desperate measures. For example, if your phone is tempting you to look at ungodly things or tempting you to sexual immorality, turn it off. Delete the app. Or give up the smartphone entirely. Better to enter heaven with no phone than to be cast into hell for endless sexual idolatry. See, it makes sense when you apply it. It clicks. But I would wager getting rid of one's smartphone is much more difficult for many than cutting off one's own hand. If your entertainment holds you captive and keeps you from being present with family and friends, if it keeps you from being present with the Lord, or if it keeps you from properly parenting your children, it's time to give up that entertainment. Fast from social media or turn off the news. Unsubscribe from that streaming service. Better to enter heaven without social media than to be thrown into hell with all of the latest information at your fingertips. These examples may sound extreme, and we laugh because of that, because I think in one sense we have been blessed, and in another sense we're not used to thinking with that perspective. But this is the sort of seriousness with which we need to treat our own sin. As Jesus again said, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Brothers and sisters, we are running to obtain God's promises. And we do have great hope if we are actively running for those promises because, as James reminds us again, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Satan likes an easy target. We are running to obtain these promises, and the greatest of those promises, eternal life secured through Christ Jesus, the glory of that promise should outshine all else in this earthly life. If we submit ourselves to God's discipline, Life will not necessarily be easy for us, but we are guaranteed that Christ will carry us across the finish line into that heavenly city.